This episode of Primary and Secondary Modcast is brought to you by Nighthawk Custom Firearms. Out of the box with upgrades you need, ready for carry, duty, or combat. Hey everyone, Matt Lanter here with Primary and Secondary. Welcome to Modcast. Today we're going to be talking about a, f- a fairly popular sub- subject being how do you find an instructor? How do you find a good instructor? Um, personally, with, with my background, I've had a lot of training handed to me on a nice silver plate. Okay, it wasn't silver. It was the minimum required standards of a plate. But <coughs> I had, I've, I've been given a lot of training and... Uh, it gave me a good idea of what to look for and what not to look for. The minimum required so, let's see standards here. of a plate. But, <laughs> and I have a, there we go. So hopefully, yeah, we'll have a, a few people more, or a few more people joining us here. Um, my background is in law enforcement. I'm approaching 20 years. It's it's been a good journey. Learn a lot. Uh, e- even the even the corrections aspect that I, I was in for two years working in a jail. Excellent opportunity to get all kinds of training and also deal with all types of people. Um, do a lot of that uh, a lot of that primary and secondary stuff online, social media, video games. It's a good time. I enjoy it. Varg, how about you? What's what's your background? Um. So. I'm the owner and head instructor of One Life Defense out of Northeast Ohio. I do primarily firearms and some combatives training. Uh, I'm also uh, working the industry full time, and I'm uh, the VP of Search Management at Gap Marketing. So I handle uh, all the SEO stuff with them, and uh, basically in this industry full time. Uh, my background is in extreme civilian level criminal violence um, at, at a participation level. Uh, so, so that's where I'm coming from when I talk about the, the aspect of criminal violence. I, I really appreciated our conversation last time on one of our last shows, how we discussed the similarity between your background, what you've been through and SEO. It was, it makes a lot of yeah. sense. It's really yeah. cool. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Picking up those patterns and applying them. <laughs> I love it. Um, Mike, you're yes, up. Sir. Well, Mike Lewis, um, Retired military, did 20 years in the Army. Um, retired about 16 months ago. Um, like you, Matt, had a lot of a lot of training presented to me, and some was effective, some wasn't. Take the best of, of what you get. And about eight or nine years in, after taking a concealed weapons course, I decided to try my hand at it. Um, went, got NRA certified like everybody else, and didn't exactly know what I was getting into when I got into it. Um, did that for a few years, started doing defensive pistol a little bit. And right now with retirement and the militaristic look and tone of, of the company I was running at the time, I'm, I'm in the middle of a rebrand. So I will be coming back up on the net with a new company here in the near future. And um, yeah, right now I'll work on a, on a training site, do a little bit of work there. A little bit of product development and a little bit of consulting on the side while I'm working on getting back into the game. <laughs> Scott Jedlinski, we're doing we're doing background stuff right now. Intros. Uh, I, I have none. Move on. No, just kidding. Um, so uh, Scott Jedlinski, non mill, non leo, lifelong martial artist. I shoot a lot. Uh, I train a lot. I practice a lot. Sponsored USPSA competitor. And uh, that's it. I run Modern Samurai Project, which is an enthusiast page. Have you ever been removed from an, a United Airlines flight? Oh, you know, that's interesting. That has been the topic of con- uh, discussion, annoyingly, in my household. Uh, the answer, A, is no. B, uh, no? 
Yeah, no. Uh, that would be an interesting proposition, man. That would be a. Uh, it depends on what I had to get to get home to. I agree. Yeah, you know, but then again, dude. If, honestly, you know, I, 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 if Leo asked me to move, I would move. That's me. I'm not saying that right, that's right, wrong, or indifferent um, on that situation. But uh, yeah, man, that's interesting. That whole situation is a shit show. Yeah. Getting the end. And just like I said on my Facebook page, I wish there was a setting on Facebook where I could put in keywords that I will not see for a set duration of time on my, on my newsfeed because I'm tired of hearing about that. I'm tired. I'm already tired of hearing the word Moab. <laughs> uh, it's awesome, but <laughs> yeah. I hear Adam you. is here. Adam Wilson. I see he's here, at least on my screen. Uh, it was a, there we are. We're, we're doing intros. Uh, all right. If it's that time, then, uh, yeah, my name's Adam Wilson. Uh, 13 years active duty Army sniper. Um, over to Iraq, running sniper sections. Uh, started at assault team. Went from there. Ended up active duty at Brigade Smallers, Master Gunner, running 54 snipers in the Striker Brigade, teaching a lot of infantrymen, advanced rifle marksmanship and whatnot. Currently, the APO, or Ashbury Precision Ordnance, uh, rifle craft instructor. So, transitioned from um, over to the civilian sector, and now we're doing a lot of work with long-range hunters, um, recreational shooters, pushing, you know, out to 2,000 yards with rifles and uh, seeing shooters from all skill levels and all backgrounds coming out. How's, uh, how's Virginia treating you there, Adam? Brother, I'm absolutely loving it up here. There it is, man. <laughs> Greatest goddamn state in the year. Nice. I, I still can't say that one. You know, uh, Texas is still <laughs> the best country. We just got to get rid of the governor. Other than that, man, <coughs> that place is awesome. All, all I'm saying is I spent my morning in the brush uh, tracking the poacher, um, tried to sneak in a little bit of turkey hunting, huh. walked into the office with mud still on my boots, uh, even bat an eye as I came prancing in with the you know, hunting bow strapped to my back. And uh, I spent the afternoon working with a dude who's made – you know, millions, if not billions of dollars, uh, how we can approach customers in the shooting community and grow our community, like hunting bow and a, a suppressed rifle on my back. So, plain, bro. That's strong. That is strong. Cool. So, uh, yeah, our topic's going to be talking about finding instructors. Um, just to go back to what I said before, uh, with the background in law enforcement, there's a lot of training that's hand, handed off to me. Um, there's a lot of mandatory stuff. Unfortunately, a lot of the mandatory stuff is not as, in my eyes, as important as firearms, not as, as, as important as like EVO, emergency vehicle operations. So with that, there's a lot of good and there's a lot of bad. Um, a lot of law enforcement officers, the, the extent of their training is uh, preparation for qualification, and that's it. It's not looking to make them better. It's not look, looking to make them a gunfighter or survive anything. It's to, pass a, it's to check a box and pass a qualification. So I found early on that I was not happy with that, so I sought after training. Um, one of the first uh, training opportunities I took was through, um, what was the name of the company? It was... I can't remember, but the, the instructor was Ehor Balaban, who later turned into, he, I, I forced him to marry my sister. Um, awesome guy. Uh, afterwards, I wound up being on Light Fighter and read a lot of AARs and discovered this guy, Pat Rogers. And the stuff Pat described, the, the way he explained these, these courses and the information he provided in an after action report was awesome. It provided everything that I wanted to know about a class, everything from the gear I need, the weapon I need, uh, what to expect. Um, it, it, it set me up to be prepared for a, a course 
So with that in mind, I wound up hosting the guy for a number of years. Um, wonderful, wonderful experience. Unfortunately, I don't believe the general public are aware of these types of resources where after action reports are an awesome source of information. <coughs> Mike, how early on in your career, uh, how did you go about finding good instructors? Uh, well, sir, I didn't go about finding good instructors until I'd been in about nine years as far as on the civilian side or the non-active duty side goes. Uh, up until that time, I had training presented to me. And again, I took my first CCW class and then, you know what, I, I want to go do the NRA thing. And I met this awesome dude, actually these two or three awesome dudes. Uh, one, two of them actually worked for LMS Defense at the time. And they said, in other words, they basically said, young Padawan, come here, hang out with us. And from there, talking to them, getting to know them, caught the training bug, and it took off. Uh, in the military, did you have any opportunities for professional development where you could choose what to actually take? Or was, it, was everything spoon-fed? Oh, it, it depends on the career track. It depends on the career path. Um, at the at the tail end of my career, I was able to pick and choose a little bit more due to the position I was in. But up until then, if I wanted to go out and do something specialized, I'd, I'd you know already attained the rank of staff sergeant by the time I got into training. And you know, a staff sergeant's not typically going to go to sniper school and this and that and the other. So I had to go find it on my own. You know, that was one of the interesting aspects of our last conversation uh, when it was you, me and, and Ray about how the military doesn't necessarily have like a gunfighter school or a they'll, they'll have you shoot, but there's nothing as as refined as that. And it's interesting how many people uh, rely on pure military service as a back uh, as a basis for this is what this is why my my opinion counts. I, I've uh, had yes. uh, I've had some coworkers that relied on that, and unfortunately, the, the 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 chiefs or the brass in the police department were also under that impression. Well, since you were in the military, you should know this. Yeah, interesting yeah, stuff. Matt, um, well, actually, I think Adam was going to say on, something. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, one of the reasons reason, I mean, in the last possibly years. Uh, programs that the Army has started to push out specifically through the AMU or the Army Marksmanship Unit is the Master Marksmanship Trick Course. And I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I think that's a five week course now. And it basically combines your small arms uh, marksmanship, which is, hey, we're going to teach you how to run every damn weapon you have for and the crew, crew systems. Hey, Adam, I, I don't, you're not very intelligent. You, you're very digital. I'm sorry. Oh, you're completely uh, digital. Uh, digital. Adam was getting into the master marksmanship training course. Yes, sir. Uh, master marksmanship trainer course. It started about two and a half years ago. It went through pilot phase. It is now an official course, a program of record, if you will. It's a five-week course. It runs through basic rifle marksmanship, short-range marksmanship, mid-range marksmanship, and training management. It, it's a great course for for general trainers, but within the military because it, it focuses in the last week or the last phase. It focuses heavily on training management, but it only focuses on the M4 M16 platform. And they do some pistol work but the pistol work is more oriented towards working the short sight radius and the trigger of a pistol to increase the skill transitioning back to a rifle, the pistol being more unforgiving a system. Now, so in addition, the, multiple other installations, uh, Fort Campbell has stood up the Eagle Master Gunner course where they're doing a similar effort, but they're working all small arms weapon systems uh, 10th Mountain Division does the, or has been doing the uh, Advanced Rifle Marksmanship, which is a train the trainer course, followed by the Urban Combat Leaders course and the Machine Gun Leaders course. Fort Lewis, to my knowledge, has stood up a schoolhouse 
Uh, there are things going on with the 173rd Airborne Brigade in Italy. Um, last I heard, there may be things working with 4th Brigade Airborne 25th Infantry Division in Alaska. And, and there's things going on here at Fort Bragg in the 82nd. So there, there is a culture growing cool. of people recognizing there needs to be more training. And some of the schools are being stood up at Fort Benning. Some are being stood up at installations as organizational schoolhouses within the units. So, you know, what you're seeing there is actually, can you hear me, Prime? Yes. Much better. All right. Yeah, I'm, I'm literally like leaning right against the Wi-Fi router. Like I said, <laughs> got to love mountain life. Uh, <laughs> So what ultimately happened there, you know, is so many of us identified the fact that, yeah, we suck actual legit gunfighting, uh, at least in the Army. Back up, we can teach you how to, you know, beat a guy with overwhelming firepower. But there's a definite, you know, ability gap with gunfighting. And yes. uh, the, as I understand it, the Master Marksmanship Trainer uh, course came about as a I won't say 100% solution, but a step in the right direction of teaching guys the individual ability that, you know, more experienced at legit gunfighters that identified that they needed to do to get away from the concept of, okay, you know, my M9 is just a chow hall gun when I don't want to carry my rifle. Um, it's like, okay, what happens if you legit have to use that thing? So um, there has been some pushback, and we're finally starting to see some programs that are, you know, addressing those deficiencies. Very cool. Now, Varg, you ha we've already established you have a very interesting background. Mm -hmm. How did you incorporate that in finding reputable instructors? Um, so it, it's really interesting to me, but uh, I started out really looking um, and looking back retrospectively because I had done a lot of fighting at the criminal violent level. Um, and, you know, I've put holes in guys. I've had holes put in me. So this is a no bullshit thing. I'm coming from a fucking perspective that when I look at somebody as an instructor, it's a whole different paradigm. Um, and so that's what led me to guys like uh, um, John Chapman and, and John Spears and, and, you know, all the guys at Alliance Police Training and, uh, and started to really – this whole, um, there's a community, you know, there's, there's pretty much, we all have it pretty much worked out at like who's, who's who in this community. And you just kind of gravitate towards that when you, when you finally gravitate away from the bullshit. Uh, and I know that sounds like, like inner circle ish, but it's really fucking true. Like, um, the guys that actually have some experience behind them and, and, and are articulate and can uh, convey the mindset part of it, which is what attracts me because it's 80% in, in my world, it's 80% of what goes on in a fight. Um, those are the guys I look for with the, the experience and the, the track record and the, in the stature. And I didn't give a fuck about credentials like per se, like I didn't, cause I've known, you know, half of my family on my dad's side were military they're the last fucking people I want handling guns around me at all. Um, they're, they're terrible, you know. So just having been in the military or just having done, you know, law enforcement or something is not a criteria I would judge anybody by. Um, but a lot of people don't. They don't have that, unfortunately. They don't have that perspective. You know, I, I, I identified with what you said about the, the circle over mm -hmm. with, with the Alliance people. I see that also with uh, all of us at Primary and Secondary. Mm -hmm. that we have this there's this there's something and it's uh it's cool to be part of and it's cool to be able to talk to real people and get real and get real responses and real answers mm -hmm. now scott you have the background in your jujitsu and your comp your competition that gets you killed on the streets yeah every day what came first with all of this uh, the jujitsu came first. So, uh, I think we talked about it on modcast before, but I'll refresh everyone's ever. So I was very blessed, right? So how I got into shooting was, uh, training jujitsu, uh, 
friend of mine that I met through that, Al DeLeon, who uh, works for the uh, mobile security division <laughs> of the State Department, former Marine, yada, 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 you know, protecting principles and stuff for the State Department. Uh, he, for those of you that don't know about jujitsu, if you train three or four days a week, you might be a black belt in eight to 10 years. So it's not easy. Usually you get your blue belt, which is the second belt, depending on how hard you train a year, maybe to two years. So with Al, you had a 280 pound pure muscle, six, six destroyer of souls who was a three year white belt because he kept on getting deployed. Uh, and I just thought that simply couldn't stand. So when he was back in the States, uh, I gave him private lessons until he got his blue belt. Uh, to pay me back, he asked me if I shoot, and I said I own a gun. Mm. Uh, <laughs> so he goes, okay, well, let me teach you how to shoot. And uh, I was very fortunate of that because at the time, he, uh, the uh, well before that, his main instructor of training uh, at the State Department was Matt Jaquies, right? Which I didn't know at the time. But that's where it comes from. And one of the things that he had told me, he goes, as far as pistol shooting goes, especially for the civilian, every single outstanding pistol shooter that I have ever met did not have Miller Elio experience. The best. You know, and they were bringing in people like Barnhart and uh, and uh, Vogel and things of that nature. Um, not saying that I didn't fall into the trap of the cult of personality when he got shipped out again. You know, I wanted all the training I could find and dude had, you know, uh, a background, but he was teaching a concealed carry course. And in hindsight, he must have made up 90% of the shit he came up with in that class. Right. Uh, getting back to the blessed part, uh, living 15 minutes from F3 tactical in Chantilly. Uh, when I found <laughs> them, they set me straight. They got me in contact with people like Matt Jaquies, who, when I first took his class, I discovered that he had trained Al before, which was awesome. Uh, obviously, uh, Steve Fisher, people like uh, Mike Green down here of Green Ops. Uh, who else? Um, you know, uh, Pat Rogers, even though I never got the chance to train with Pat, I met him once, and all of my mentors, he was their mentor. Uh, so I, you know, in, in that respect, I was a bit, uh, shielded from some of the bullshit out there. Uh, and I credit that to my quick progression with, uh, with pistol skills. So that is cool. And it's, it's funny how all the good people are just all connected. Yeah, yeah. The other thing is, I I, I, had a, I have a pretty good bullshit uh, radar when it comes to training from the jujitsu background. Uh, the parallels between jujitsu and shooting are unbelievable. I mean, to me, it, it, it's all the same, right? Just a different tool, just another method of application. But the shysters in jujitsu use the same technique as the shysters in gunfighting, you know? Stuff that where the, the rap is good, it kind of makes sense. And then you ask them to demo it, and they're like, I'm sorry, I don't do that. You know? <laughs> so. <coughs> we had a really good conversation about that, too. And I don't remember if it was on one of these or one of our discussions on the side about instructors not willing to uh, demonstrate. <laughs> uh, can I pitch in on that one? Oh, yeah. Um, I've always tried to make it a, a habit of if I'm going to shit talk you, uh, I'm probably going to try to actually see firsthand what's going on. So if I'm going to say, you know, X instructor is full of shit, he's great at marketing, um, has a great spiel, but as far as content, you know, it's pretty shady. Happen. I'm either going to attend your class so I can say, dude, I saw it firsthand. This is this is how it is. Or I'm going to walk up to you, I'm going to tell you to your face what I think, so you know where we stand. It's this great example of that. Not a huge fan for a lot of obvious reasons. Don't feel the need to take one of his classes, but I made damn sure I stood there and t told the man what I thought to espouse my opinion on it, right? Um, I've seen some professional, high-quality instructors 
Rob Pincus, Greg's a really good following in some some circles. Really horrible following in another uh, circles. And fourth with some of his other instructors who I consider friends on why don't you demo down from higher. Like Pincus says, this is what we're going to do and this is what we're not going to do. And some of his own instructors are saying, no. And I think everybody's spot on. If your instructor isn't willing to stand up there and demo it, it sounds why are they not there i don't care if the nra is saying oh he's the greatest guy we support him i don't care if he's got to deal with everybody under the sun for sponsorship and marketing and a world tour if the dude can't stand up there and tell you why it works and why it doesn't and then show you let me go find somebody else you know and the precision rifle community where you know, too often we have students who show up and they're trying to shoot and they're like, I don't know, maybe it's just the gun, you know, pop down, shoot the rifle. And that's when you make the call of, dude, I really hope I can pull this off. <laughs> like, this is somebody else's gun. I don't know what's going on. I better be able to perform what I'm telling them to, or I'm going to look like a jackass too. So if your instructor is not up there and not demoing it or not capable of, don't waste your money. Go find somebody else. Mm -hmm. Hey guys, Matt just messaged. He lost his uh, he lost his connection. All right. So hopefully he comes let's back. Just, up. Yeah, let, let's just flow off of that. We can, can I uh, can I say something about coming off of what he said about yep. that? Yep. Um. So so I shoot a, a tremendous amount in my classes. I I try to, um, and it's just to uh. Uh, one of the biggest things that I that I accomplished through that is to sh is, is nobody ever shoots a hundred percent, and I step up and show them, and I'm not shooting fucking hundred percent either. Like there are days, and I've been blessed with an alumni of people that come that have been trained with me for years, and I'll point that out in any class. I'll say, how many of you guys have seen me shoot fucking fantabulous? And they'd be like, oh, we have. And I said, how many have seen me come out here and not be able to hit shit? Uh, and, and you'll get a few and that's that's important to give a realistic expectation to a fucking student too uh, because there's that side of it you should be able to execute the things that you're that you're teaching and the whys that you're teaching but you can um you should also be able to step up there and if you do falter like when he says am i going to be able to pull this off like if some shit does go wrong um you got to show that 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 that's part of fucking real life too and it's part of training you know for everybody, and I don't give a shit who you are. Everybody, nobody steps up 100% at bat all the time. Nobody. Yeah, I, I think there's a huge yeah. difference between, you know, thinking that you can step up or expecting somebody to be 100% that we're all human. And you hit it on the head with the, you know, you can use it as a, an uh, educational or uh, illustration for why you do something. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when we start briefing long gun stuff, I'll tell guys, I'm like, look, if your scope's got a zero stop where you bottom it out, use it. If you move from a position, make sure you dial the, the dope on your gun before you move, or you're going to find yourself in a position where you don't know where you are on your scope. Doing a class uh, like two years ago was trying to be all hardcore about you got to do this, you got to do this, got to do this. Got on the gun to demo uh, fundamentals. First round I fired, you know, I was like, where the hell is that? Mm -hmm. I'm at 100 yards. It's nowhere on paper going on. Look at the scope. I hadn't dialed it back from the last time I thought I th uh, shot 1,000. Like, and yeah. I was like, yep. And that's, that's the illustration of why you do it, because anybody can make that mistake. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we can't forget, some people are just visual learners. If you can't do something, demonstrate them for some, something visually, you are leaving out a large uh, sect of the way people learn. And, uh, you know, I mean, as far as like pistol classes, I mean, how many times have you guys had said, you know, I, I just, uh, there's something wrong with my gun. My sights are off. Something's wrong with my gun, you know? And I know it's attributed to Pat McNamara, but uh, I've seen Steve do this and so much, Fisher do this in so many classes going, let me see your gun. Let's back up five yards. Boom. It's 
the most accurate gun I've ever shot in my life and drops the mic and walks off. If you can't do that, what, you know, what validation do they have that you know what you're talking about? So, yeah. Well, if I can add in here, guys, if you mind. Um, the first, yeah. the first instructor development course I took yeah. other than NRA, you know, that's whatever, um, was from Troy Price. And Troy exposed me to the method of EDIP was the acronym he used. Explain, demonstrate, imitate, practice. And as he introduced the class to that and had us student teaching and did that, I saw parallels to what I've been exposed to in the military where everything we did you know, you've got your PowerPoint, whatever. But if it was a skills-based block of instruction, any solid instructor would do a talk through by the numbers. As he did by the numbers, he was demonstrating the skill. And then he would turn around and have us do the skill by the numbers. And then he would have us practice it. And just looking at that, it's a, it's a great TTP. All right. All right. Looks like we're live, guys. Uh, so, hey, guys, everybody, um, thanks for sticking with us here. Uh, Landfair lost his internet connection, and we were talking uh, and didn't really notice. So now we got the new link up. Uh, hopefully, you guys have joined with us. So we're going to try and hop back in, a little rewind some of the stuff that we thought um, – you guys may have missed, so if it's redundant, forgive us, but it was good information, so we're going to repeat it anyway. Uh, Varg, what, what was the subject that you wanted to start off with? I think right before we cut off, uh, somebody had asked a question about, um, you know, should you choose an instructor based on what it is that you you are training for and, and okay. typically pick an instructor that has done that? Yeah, so <laughs> let, me read the, let me read the question to be specific, Okay. Uh, isn't finding an instructor really based on your goals and shouldn't that include someone that has been there uh, if that's where you're at versus a guy that's never done it? I further clarified that because we have an interesting panel. You have two guys that never been mill, never LEO, and two guys uh, that were in the army that have been there and you know done that. So what is your guys? Wait, 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 wait. Don't, no, don't, don't use that terminology. I'm not going to. Okay. Slide. Okay. We're right. talking about. Yeah, I was, I was actually. Okay. Fair I was going to hop on that one too because, like, dude, Jedi, you cannot tell me that Varg hasn't. And, like, anybody who's like, oh, hey, I've done some shit. Agreed. Agreed. Yep. Sorry, I'll back it up. I'll back it up. All right. With. Well, I'm just saying there are guys I want to train with just because of their demonstrated ability or how they articulate and develop things. And Varg's one of the guys who's on my short list of I want to train with. Not because he's Mill, not because he's Ellie, anything like that. Because what he's teaching and his, his what we considered the norm. The whole, oh, they, they're military, they've done that. Dude, there's some star majors and, and, you know, commanders out there who got experience, but they got 20 years in the Army. And we've been at war for how long? Like, that is not a standard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And that's, uh, and that's exactly what I'm talking about um, when I say that, you know, I wouldn't let that go. Like, that's uh, – and, and that's what I look for, too. And there's different things that uh, – um, when we're talking about different instructors out here who are doing the marketing thing really well – but they don't have uh, any real substance in terms of experience. You know, there's things you can learn from these people that have never really done it. Uh, there's things that are developed on the range and on, on the mat that actually are, are pretty good. But most of what, what I hold value to is shit that I, that's paid for in blood. Uh, so, you know, when you're talking about fighting, then you learn from somebody who's fucking fought. When you're talking about technique in terms of uh, fundamental skills and marksmanship, then then we're on a different subject and, and so forth. Um, but but yeah, so it's not just credential based. And like he said, you know, like I have um, I have a friend who is uh, whose daughter is a captain, airborne, uh, jump master, 
and uh, is in captain school right now in Arizona. Um, and she went in as like a fucking lieutenant or something and through that college or, or, you know, ROTC and shit. And so like you would think, uh, you know, that the average perspective of a civilian is a warrior or a captain, you must know all kinds of shit. But in reality, like I would take some of my buddies that, uh, that are fucking grunts and, and never got above a very uh, uh, high basic rank ever, but seen a lot of shit. Then I would take somebody like her into a fucking fight with me. You know what I mean? Uh, and that, that's, that's basically what I think needs to be clarified uh, across the board, whether it's LE or military or anybody with these instructors, is that if you're going to talk about fighting, you need to have fucking done some fighting to, to actually know what you're talking about, in my opinion. You, you, you know, I'd go... That, Sorry. I, I was going to say, thanks to Hollywood and all that nonsense, there's this misconception that, oh, if a dude was in the Army, he's Rambo. If a guy was in the Navy, he's a Navy SEAL. Like, he's got cool hair and Ray-Bans and a six-pack. He was, you know, a, a Navy SEAL. <laughs> Bullshit, man. There are SF cats out there who have deployed. And all they know is the circle of experience of, okay, somebody gave me this gun, this ammo. These are the tactics I use. You know, outside of that, they're not gun dudes. A limited scope. And a better example would be there's a lot of young snipers who are coming out of sniper school and they can tell you exactly what to do with the weapon systems they're issued and the ballistics they're given there. But you ask them something else, you ask them a wildcat. You ask them, hey, man, what do you know about the 375 shy tack Oh, no, never heard of that. Must suck. <coughs> it's setting two-mile records right now. Army use it. So you can't look at it from a standpoint of a guy is – Fill in the blank. He should know that arena. Not nah, unless he's done. What? Probably doesn't know too much about it. Mm -hmm. You know, I kind of take a, a different look at it too. Um, I know some guys that have, you know, been over there, put bullet to face. You know, no finer human being to go into a fight with. But when you ask them the finer points of how they do what they do, why they do what they do. It's like they're chewing rocks when they give you an answer, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but on the other hand, <coughs> there's master class IDPA master class USPSA shooters out there that, you know, even though they may, some of them may have been in a, in a gunfight. Some of them may not have been in a gunfight, but if, if that individual can articulate, how to accurately deliver precision fires at a high rate of speed. I'm not going to go talk to that dude about tactics, mm -hmm. but I'm going to ask him how to make me a very fast, very lethal shot. And then I'll go see somebody that has done it and can articulate on tactics. So, you know, the two are not the same. You can find a great shooter that can't tell you shit. And you can find a mediocre shooter they can break it down to quantum physics. It, it just, the main thing there is finding the dude that can articulate what you want to learn and put the pieces together, pull a technique here, pull a tactic there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. <coughs> All right. So what do you guys think about then um, the, the going back to the demonstration part? Um, if, if, the, if the person has real experience or doesn't have real experience, um, they still should be able to, to demonstrate to step up and should do that all the time. And if it's in somebody that's like, well, you know, I'm not spending the money on ammo every time I go out. I train every single week. And I, and I shoot every, every week and I spend a significant amount of money on ammo every year annually. Um, so I don't think that's a good excuse. What do you guys think? Mike. Uh, well, that comes both, both back to my, my industry experience and my military experience, as I was saying earlier, when we got disconnected, uh, my first industry experience in an instructor development course, was was with 
Troy Price. He's turned out to be a great friend and mentor over the years. But Troy exposed us to the acronym he used was EDIP, Explain, Demonstrate, Imitate, Practice. You explain the skill first, then you demonstrate the skill by the numbers. You know, take draw stroke, for example. Step one, you know, elbow to the rear, firing hand grip, release or retention, blah, 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 all the way through sights and trigger. And you do it by the numbers. Then you have the shooters imitate starting by the numbers and then at their own pace and then accelerated pace. And then you practice. Now, going back to the military side, that, that brought on a light bulb that every time I had learned a skill in the military, before and after that, it used that EDIP even when the, the word wasn't used. It used that, that technique in teaching. And personally, I question any instructor that's not comfortable explaining and demonstrating because he's showing the students what right looks like. And then as the students are going through by the numbers and then at their own pace, and then at the accelerated pace that the instructor's looking for or approaching the accelerated pace, the instructor's looking for key points as well to make the corrections and get the shooters where they should be. So if, if an instructor doesn't do those things, I, I personally question them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it goes to um, what, it, what, it, what it's relating to the student, right? So the whole thing is, we're going to show you some skills here. We're going to show you the methodology. We're going to show you the drills. And then, you, you know, you're going to take these things and go home and practice. But by you not drilling them or, or demoing them, you are showing that there is doubt on whether or not you believe, you know, the snake oil that you are selling it. Because obviously you're not practicing it. You can't do it here. Um, so, Adam, what, what are your thoughts on that? I'm actually going to play the devil's advocate real quick. Um, so often when we have these discussions and we put them into the context of um, military law enforcement self-defense, that's the only types of shooting that we address. Well, obviously with you being here, Jedi, uh, competition. But what about the recreational shooter or even the hunter? You know, the guy who's going out there um, and wants to teach his, you know, kid, hey, look, just shoot some tin cans. Like, I'm not going to expect dad to stand up there and like, all right, son, I want you to demo how you're going to do this VTAC, you know, uh, drill on tin cans. And I'll walk his, his kid through, here's basic fundamentals. From um, a non-shooting, non you know, uh, point of view at all. Um, but I also have developed a love for archery, right? And I'm seeing a crossover from bow hunting or what we do with rifle and bow hunting. First time I had somebody to walk me through, here's what you do with a bow. Dude, they gave me the, they gave me the basic concept. Then they had me do it. And then they critiqued what I was doing because I didn't know what I was looking for when I watched them. And just watch you do it. But I may not get as much of a return as when I try to perform a task and then you say, okay, move your hand here okay, or release the, the, the arrow here. So I think it does tie into what you were saying of what's the student trying to get away from it, but also what's the intent for whatever we're trying to do. You know, because some things don't necessarily need um, a by the numbers approach to <laughs> shoot in hands with your kid, you know. So I think there's a give and take on that. Um, yeah, so, so that, uh, that part of it, you know, the, the relevant experience demonstration, um, all of that stuff comes into play, but like what, what he just said about learning from doing, as opposed to learning from watching, I think I run into students that are on both sides of that. Um, and some learn more from watching, some learn more from doing, but I think everybody at a certain point can't do until you do. And that's what it comes down to. You have to. So the way I teach is I like to walk through. Um, I'll, I'll do a demo and then I'll come back and make them do it over and over and over. And then I'm critiquing. And one of the things I say is 
if I'm saying the same thing to you and over and over, like if I'm coming up to you saying you got to move that left hand, got to move that left hand, watch that left hand, uh, that's something you want to remember because you know you're going to need to train yourself forward after you leave here. So one of the things that I think a good instructor will try to do at that point is to um, is to convey to them what their particular issues are and how to correct themselves so that they can be their own voice in their head, uh, their own instructor over their over their shoulder when they're not at your class anymore and they're on the range or they're you know practicing up by themselves. I think that's that's an incredibly important point to that. Agreed, agreed. Um, you know, my, uh, the same guy Tim is giving us some other good questions here, and I, I'm going to ask it, even though I don't know, it, it's a little strange. But does fear of liability play a part in the hesitance to demonstrate, though, especially for self-defense courses? He put out SD. I, I'm assuming that's self-defense. Mm -hmm. so, what do you guys think out there? Is there some misconception by instructors that? If they demo something, there's going to be some form of liability. I don't, I don't think as an instructor you should be telling someone to do something that you would be afraid to demo for liability reasons. Like if you're fucking telling them to do it, you it that's it. That the, the act of even telling them to do it is, uh, is uh, a liability issue. Um, and, and I want to point out, too, that Chuck Haggard uh, – mentioned in the comments there that uh, somebody should mention an instructor you can go to court with. Uh, and, and that kind of ties in with that. Like that's, that's not, if somebody's saying something that, that they would not be willing to demo because of liability reasons, they shouldn't be fucking saying it. That wouldn't be the instructor you can go to court with. Um, you know, like, like you, you need to have a, a really well written lesson plan that can also double as a deposition for court. Uh, first of all, like if you if you go to court as a student and say my my fucking instructor told me I could anchor people, uh, you've got the people in the class, you've got all the character witness, you've got the the curriculum, you know, you've got the things that you teach down to to a science, um, and it's nothing that you're not willing to step up and demo or say on in public on the internet or do at any point in time for liability reasons. A professional is a professional all the fucking time, um, and you're always liable for what you say and do. You know, so I think that's a huge yeah. If there's if there's somebody that's in that position where they don't want to fucking back up what they're saying because they don't want to be personally uh, responsible for it, then don't say it, and you shouldn't train with that person. I think it also comes to how they develop their curriculum. Are they? you know legitimately doing it as a you know fuck it we'll do it live and coming up with it on the fly because they're just that badass in their own mind or have they sat down you know like <coughs> will petty um will petty's a good example if you watch will on um social media he is constantly posting updates about hey i'm refining the class um we got new new data for this like he's doing legit homework And that allows them to step up there and say, you know, okay, this is why we do what we do within this context. Um, and not have to re worry as much about repercussions because if he does stand in front of somebody and they say, hey, how do you come to that conclusion? He can say, boom, the data supporting my opinion. Here is technical showing this is why we do what we do. Now, whether you agree with it or not, I'm not going down that path. I'm saying – as an instructor, he took the, the time to develop a curriculum. And too many instructors don't do that. They've simply, simply said, well, you know, I did this enough times when I was in combat or I spent X amount of years doing it or I qualified as, you know, a grandmaster, grand pooba, you know, ninja, an actual legit curriculum. Um, and I'm as guilty as that as anybody else. And that's one reason that, you know, I'm, I'm bringing it up now. The first class I ever taught, dude, I legit did it as a, fuck it, I'll do it live. <coughs> the end state was not what it should have been. You know, I was like, ah, I'm an army sniper. I can do this. I'm just going to do what we do with army snipers. And, you know, God bless it. Nobody complained. 
I don't think they realized how bad it really was. <laughs> but I realized the mistake I made. And then I just say, okay, what needs to go into a curriculum? Things that we've done with uh, Riflecraft now is there are full-on instructor guidebooks outlining um, enable learning objectives, terminal learning objectives, and everything. And the intent isn't to say, okay, if I go to court, I have supporting documents. Student who's there, you know, paying their money to learn a quality product. So even if I have a bad day, or if I can't teach that class and somebody else comes in, follow that instructor guidebook, they're going to pull off an 80% solution on that class. And the student's going to walk away with quality information that's supported by curriculum development. And I think that's a big difference between the professional instructor and the instructor who's cashing in on Instagram likes and Facebook followers. Mike? Um, hip pocket training is not a preferred technique <laughs> to, to add on to what Adam was saying. Um, when I started, I, I had a guide that I had written for myself. <coughs> It was sorely lacking. So what I did is I took tips and tricks that I learned from other trainers I had worked under, tips and tricks I had learned from you know my professional experience prior to that point, tips and tricks I learned on the range, in front of students, in the classroom, what have you, and continually develop my curriculum. Um, the the main point I'll get there is if an instructor gets so dead set in their ways and so dogmatic in what they do and they're they stagnate mm -hmm. you know we as trainers cannot be stagnant we have to continually push forward look for best practices i know what i did last week i know what i did the week before last and it worked the week before last and it worked last week and i know what i did in combat whether it worked well all my guys came home alive so it worked but was it a preferred technique so we have to seek out the best techniques and continue to drive forward and use those lessons learned to continue to develop doctrine at all times. I think one of the one of the most beneficial things I ever did, I was fortunate to get into the uh, the LMS um, instructor development course with Chappie, uh, which is like a 40 hour course is uh, pretty intense. By far the most intense instructor development course I had taken, but one of the biggest things I took away from that was an even greater academic approach to writing a curriculum, and it was it was based on both being very clear for the points that Adam brings up and, and Mike brings up about um, you know knowing what you're going to do and having other guys be able to step into your place and all that. But also, you know, to have it be a court document at some point in time, um, you know, if this person has a shoot and they've been to that course, you might get called up on the carpet and you just shoot that over with a deposition to the prosecutor. This is the course that they took. This is what is covered. This is what is talked about. Um, and that type of instructor development is something that is, is not fucking out there. And when we're, I mean, it's out there in small pockets. Like Chappie does that course, well, he used to do that course like every five fucking years. Like you were fucking lucky to get into that. You know, if you were one of the eight dudes that got in every three or five years, like you were lucky to get into that. There's just not a plethora of that training out here on the civilian side. Um, and so the standard is too low. The standard is, is closer to guns and ammo and NRA instructor than it is to you know, serious level, let's learn about Malcolm Knowles, let's learn about adult learning modules, let's learn about, you know, how to how to make a curriculum be a court document, stuff like that. So I think raising that standard on instructor development is something that really, really needs to be pushed. Yeah, I think the only one out there for civilians that is, uh, that is uh, regular is Tom Gibbons' Range Master Instructors course. Yes. Yeah which I've, I've heard good things about. So I've never taken a course from him, but I've heard good things about it. I went through it a few years ago. It was a good course. 
Hmm. Um, it was a lot of hands-on, a lot of how to teach techniques. Tom gave a good course. Here, here's a fun question. How many of us, what, okay, so we've got varied backgrounds, varied intents with the material we present. Who doesn't have their NRA uh, instructor credentials? Who doesn't have them? Who didn't go through that sham? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let, let, let me. Uh, uh, somebody told me I have to go through the NRA training program to be a real instructor, and unfortunately, too many, too many. I don't want to say civilians, but recreational shooters or new shooters look at the NRA instructor program as validation. Gold standard. You know that is nationally recognized recognize it's the you know the gold standard like you said and yeah. the reality is when you start looking at dudes who are professional instructors who have been doing it for years i think we all agree on what you actually get out of that program oh yeah it's not <laughs> no. well, on the other hand though when i first called to uh get an instructor liability insurance policy <laughs> One of their first questions was, are you NRA certified? Yeah. Because yeah. it is nationally recognized. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of good things about the NRA course. There's a lot of good things about, about um, you know, the way they do it. Do I believe there's some left to be desired? Yes. But if you're looking for somebody that's going to teach the recreational shooter the basics of how to handle a firearm safely, and not kill themselves or somebody else as long as that's the lane that that instructor stays in you know pending they don't have other knowledge or experience from elsewhere but if that's the lane they're going to stay in i really don't see anything wrong with it right i, I agree but the problem that you run into there is we've already each of us has said you know the standard needs to be raised for instructors and nationally, we look at the NRA instructor program as a standard, be it good, bad, or indifferent. It is a recognized standard. And to the uninformed standard from guys who are professionally doing it, I think the first thing everybody says is, yeah, it may not be the best thing, but it really helped when I went to go get insurance. And if that's your major takeaway from it, then maybe we need to revamp the, that program or find a way to incorporate more adult learning into it. Yeah. So that's a great segue. I, I'm going to play devil's advocate this time, Adam, and just say that uh, Andy Lander at the training department of the NRA uh, has been working his ass off to update a lot of stuff there to get it to be more of the standard everyone thinks it should be. You know, I, I think that one of the biggest flaws about that course is that um, you can't fail it. I mean, unless you're, you point a gun at somebody, you can't fail that thing. You know, the shooting part of it uh, is not enforced from my experience with it and when I went through the course. Uh, but the guys at the NRA, Andy Lander and crew, they're, they're doing their best to get that thing up there. They're, they're just fighting against decades <laughs> of, of previous instruction, which may not have, well, which wasn't up to par, you know. But, you know, uh, on the other hand, you know, if, if one more dude says, trust me, I'm an NRA instructor, I'm going to lose my shit. <laughs> well, I mean, the whole point of tonight's conversation was, you know, choosing an instructor. Well, what happens when the instructor needs to choose an instructor? You know, like Barb pointed out, Chappie and the dudes over at LMS were a phenomenal resource if you were an instructor who wanted professional development. At the same time, instructors who have gone through the NRA program and were not getting what could be the best return on that investment. And I don't think it's for lack of what the NRA is doing. I think it's for Joe Blow, who an NRA instructor uh, program and the credentials to teach other NRA guys. And he's just mailing that check in each month. Because I know when I went through my NRA instructor program, that was a straight up scam. And it wasn't the NRA. 
it was the guy who taught me. Yeah. yeah. So I think, um, you know, do a better job of policing their own people up. Like you said, they've been doing to revamp the existing programs and develop a better product for the guys who are going to step out there as instruct instructors. We also have to look at the, the intended end state of the NRA course. The intended end state is just to teach good attitudes around weapons, safe handling skills, and rudimentary skills to be able to hit a target at a short distance. That is the intent of the NRA basic pistol or basic rifle course. So, you know, we, we, we kind of have to look at that too. They're not and, teaching gunfight 101, you know? Which goes back to what we were talking about earlier of what is the student looking to take away from it? Because that is the relevant question. That, that would answer what Varg asked earlier on. We go to this instructor if he hasn't done this. Well, dude, it just depends on what you're wanting to do. If you just want to plink cans, then yeah, dude, NRA instructor is great. Not to help uh, Boy Scouts of America. They send so many other, you know, cub, uh, or cub masters out there to get certified so they can take the young men out and teach them classes. Dude, they're not running VTAC drills. They're not jumping over hay bales or any of that shit. It's perfect for them. Look at what the intended or the student's standpoint is. Well, the, the problem in my state here in Ohio, um, it's obviously, uh, it's the requirement to be able to sign a, a concealed carry class certificate uh, that the sheriff will accept for a CHL license. Um, so the problem is, is that everybody and their brother, anybody can go, like literally anyone can pass an NRA instructor class. Um, and, and I really honestly believe that. Um, and the, so you get all these guys and what happens is they're, they're teaching a basic pistol course, which is good for all the things that we just pointed out. Like he talked about Boy Scouts and recreational shooting and plinking basic pistol works for that. The problem starts when they start to uh, want to be cool gunfighter instructors. And the only thing they've ever fucking done is taken an NRA basic pistol course as an instructor um, uh, development. And then now they're teaching gunfighting. Now they're teaching, now they're saying, you know, well, that's why I carry Kimber because I'd rather be judged by 12 carry, but see, like pack the most ridiculous shit you can into one sentence. And that's what you'll get a lot of these concealed carry classes. Um, and, and that's where the standard, that's where the standard is falling apart at. That's where we're, um, that's where we're disconnecting because the marketing world is guns and ammo magazine and fucking, uh, uh, American rifleman. And, you know, I have a cigar lounge across the street from my house that I hang out in every day. Um, and I walk in there and it's a very gun friendly atmosphere. And, uh, and just this morning, there's this conversation about, um, out. You know, if if it's a Marine doing reloads, I'll buy from them because I trust Marines. And it's this ridiculous level of shit that's just shit that doesn't make any fucking sense that marketing sells in the gun industry. And the NRA is just as, as guilty of that on that end. Um, and I understand it to a large extent because they do a great thing. I do get my insurance because I have their certification. Um, and you know, but, but we have to push the standard higher on our end and, and make these guys that are outside of their lane, like Adam points out, as long as they're staying in their lane, it's great. Once you step out of your lane, you start being a gunfighter instructor and you're not a gunfighter and you've not done anything outside of NRA stuff, you're outside of your wheelhouse and you're starting to fuck everything up at that point. Yep. So, so let, let, let's move on. That segues us to another one, right? So in, when you guys are interviewing an instructor, right, for lack of a better term, uh, what questions are you asking in order to find out that guy squared away? We are all very fortunate 
that we have that network where we can bet that guy and bet that guy and see if he's legit and see if he really has the skills he's talking about if it's worth our money. A lot of people don't have that. Um, and that's part of the goal of what we're trying to do here at primary and secondary. But w what kind of questions do you guys ask to see uh, if that guy has the skills to deserve your money? Me personally, getting on what we were just talking about before, one of the questions I ask, or tell other people to ask is who have you trained with recently? Uh, and it doesn't matter who it is, whether it's Varg or it's Adam or if it's Matt or Steve or, or, or Mike, I think we can all say who the last three courses we took were and who they were and, you know, and talk about that. What other things can you guys extrapolate on that? What other things that you guys do to vet out instructors that you may or may not have a background on? <laughs> I like the crickets there. <laughs> um, I, I got an answer for that one, but if somebody, you know, slap me down if I'm hogging up too much airtime. Yeah, I Roger that. Proceed. <laughs> I'm a self-admitted social media whore. Um, and a lot of that I'm seeing who I'm interested in training with now uh, come about because of what we're doing with YouTube, Instagram, or Facebook. You know, uh, I think, you know, 10 years ago, uh, if you were going to train with somebody because, you know, a buddy had trained with this guy when he was somewhere else and he told you stories about it. And then, you know, through a friend of a friend of a friend, you, you were introduced to it. Uh, and now thanks to the wonders of the, the internet, um, we can do more than just find porn online. You can find quality instructors. Hmm. You can find dudes who are teaching stuff that you would have never looked for, you know, in your, your local network, um, uh, uh, Overland. Like, dude, I don't know that shit about Overland other than driving a Humvee all over Iraq, which, hey, man, we've got mechanics to solve problems, you know? <laughs> If something goes wrong, we don't continue to, you know, overland. We get another <coughs> you know, um, looking at it from living in the mountain area or simply wanting to learn. You can hop online and you can start looking at who's doing overland courses and, and you know, surviving out in the backcountry. You can see what they're doing. You can look for student ARs. You can look for the content they're pushing and the quality of that content. And then you can try to get in touch with them and feel for yourself. But at least for me, my initial read comes from what content are they pushing? And some of that's going to be a smoke screen. As you become more familiar with what's real and what's nonsense, you're going to see through that smoke screen and you can look and say, okay, that guy's legit. I want to go train with him. By that same token, there's guys who should be considered legit who I've trained with who I wish I could get my money back. Yeah. <laughs> breaking in paychecks from the top names in the industry and endorsement deals, but you go to a class and you're like, this is a straight waste of time. You know, I think doing your homework through whatever means or all the means you have available to it being social media, a network of friends, or just going to check the class out firsthand and calling it, you know, a loss if it sucks, you know, the it's par for the course. It's what you got to do if you want to, you know, play the game. Yep, exactly. Bard? Um, I 100% agree with everything he just said right there. Um, <clears throat> and in particular, uh, wanted to back up what you said about um, how it's where they're training at. Um, I, spend, I spend a couple hundred hours a year minimum training. Now, granted, I work with really closely with Chappie and those guys over there at Alliance. So I, I'm in a lot of, I'm over there a lot for, for different courses and things like that. And I get to do some T and E work and, you know, uh, like the APX pistol, I was on the team, the T and E that a year ago through a two day pistol course. So I count that stuff too. Um, 
and what I try to impart to like students and, and, and people that are uh, thinking about training is, um, you know, first of all, if you're going to come to me and pay me money, I'm obligated to not rest on my laurels, but to always push myself to try to bring the best, most up-to-date information to you um, as possible and not to just be stagnant and think I can just walk out there and keep doing the same fucking thing over and over again because just like Will Petty does and everybody else who has any any substance to, uh, substance to what they teach, you constantly refine. I refine every year. Sometimes I refine class to class. Um, it depends because I learn from my students as much as I do from other instructors. Um, the other thing is that as an instructor, if you're not taking courses from other instructors, you're not learning. It's not like you're just going there to learn the actual skill stuff. Like I'm taking a gunfighting class to learn gunfighting. You're taking a gunfighting class to watch another man teach gunfighting class to learn how they teach, what methods they use to deal with certain problems in the class, how they handle certain personalities, what tricks they use to fucking set up targets, to, to expedite the, the in-between fucking things that you have to do between sessions. Like uh, that's the kind of stuff that's, when you walk onto a range and a guy's got his shit together like this, you know, typically he didn't develop that on his own. He fucking went to other classes and seen, oh, that's a great target idea or, oh, that's a good way to segue sessions. Like, you know, and that's the kind of shit as an instructor you pick up. So asking who have you trained with and how often do you go train, that's a, that's a very legitimate question. And I really like that. I've seen those guys, every one of those guys over at Alliance, you know, Chapman and Spears and all those wire. I've seen every one of those guys go through as a student. Like Gonzalez comes through, Chabby goes in and takes that class. Like that's, I have mad respect for that shit. Um, and I practice it and, and I have no respect for the instructor that doesn't think he needs to go talk to anybody else. Uh, that That's how you get on my shit list real quick. It's one way. Uh, so I think that's a legitimate thing too. Yep. Mike? Um, agreed with everything both Varg and Adam said. Um, you know, we're fortunate, like you said earlier, the guys within a certain circle can talk to people within that certain circle and vet other people. But even without that, some of the trainers I've trained with in the past, I didn't interview because we're in the age of the Internet. Their body of work is out there. And if they don't have a body of work out there, that's sub that's suspect. Um, so, you know, I saw this guy's body of work. I knew his his reputation. I'm going to go train with this guy. This guy's body of work, his reputation. Yeah, I'm going to go see what the hype's about. Um, my next course isn't even a gunfighting course. I'm going to go take the Semper Paratus uh, <coughs> AR Advanced Armors course. Why is that? Is it going to teach me to be a better gunfighter? No. But it's going to teach me to be a better master of the mechanics of the system within the AR platform. So your your instructor needs to be multifaceted. I don't care how well you shoot. Can you diagnose a stoppage? Can you teach a student how to diagnose a stoppage? How do you diagnose a stoppage? By the symptoms. If you don't know what symptom is telling you what, you don't know how to fix it. So, you know, that's that's why I'm going to go take that course. And again, William Larson, he's his body of work is out there. He's got stuff on PNS, his his you know, his reputation and yeah. That's how I chose my next course. Yeah. Cool. Anybody else got something to add on that? So, let's let's go on to something else, right? I actually um I got invited. Oh, I'm sorry. I, go ahead. Yep. Yeah. Um, on one last thing on that one. Yep. Um, I think it's also important for guys to remember that diligence is a good thing, but sometimes in the absence of a, a body of work, and I know this this goes against what I was saying earlier about the internet, but it forcing a guy you may not have heard about, no clue. Um, Kyle Lamb, 
uh, uses um, Palmer. Third of Chile, um, prior to taking a class with him a couple of years ago. Uh, you know, so unknown, but he was a VTAC instructor. Kyle said it for me. Um, turns out Chile is like a one man kill the ability to articulate what to do as far as, you know, Ve- you know, fighting in and around vehicles was spot on. So if I would have looked at it as, well, I don't know his body of work. I might not, uh, I might have passed. If somebody would have said, hey, it's a Chili Palmer vehicle fighting class, I would have been like, who the fuck is Chili Palmer? Um, but because Kyle endorsed him and it was a VTAC class and I knew that was a trusted training resource, uh, it was good enough for me. So that name may be unknown. If it's associated or with somebody who is known or you trusted, that's a good sign to do. And, you know, just because they do have a lot of social media followers or Instagram uh, doesn't necessarily mean shit talking to you. (laughs) So on that note, so let's say you guys are trying to take a class. Maybe it's with a well-known person. Uh, maybe it's not with a well-known person or something like that. Uh, I got invited into a debate today about a guy, uh, who had trained with only one individual happened to be former force recon, yada, yada. That was, uh, talking about you shouldn't have more than 200 lumens in your household because you'll get blinded other st- stuff like that. Right. And the guy took it because of this guy's background, who's very prolific on the interwebs and things, uh, as, as gospel. Right. Um, my opinion with that is when I take a class, uh, I write down and try to apply everything. The instructor is trying to say whether or not I agree with it at that point, uh, take it home, drill it, drill it. And if it doesn't work or it doesn't make sense to me, uh, I discard it. I keep what I want. I don't, I, I toss what I don't want at that point, but I still have it in my notes in case it's me not being developed enough to incorporate that <laughs> skill. Do you guys do something similar to that? Um, would you warn against, you know, cult of personalities? Because I think, Adam, you were saying before, there was guys out there that are supposed to be super legit, and the class was kind of a waste of time. So what are you guys' thoughts on that? Uh, we'll go with – let's go with let's go with Mike first. Cult of personality is bad, okay? Um, when I trained with LMS, they actually encouraged – going to see other trainers, both myself and my wife. We went through it's, it's separate occasions. And the instructors we went with said, hey, look, don't take everything we say as gospel. Figure it out for yourself. Go see another trainer. See if you find something that works there. If you like us better, come back and see us. So, you know, you don't know what you don't know about an instructor until you go see them, but do your homework before you go see them. Got to, I, I get some add to that too. Um, I'm not afraid to uh, to to go see somebody, um, and there have been times that I have trained with people who, um, you know, people in my inner circle have shunned, uh, and I've come back with some valuable things. Sometimes it's uh, some, especially if it's uh, uh, um, safety related uh, things like that. Um, but if it's, you know, if somebody is saying ridiculous things like, you know, don't have more than 200 lumens in your house and things like that, like you can walk away from that and be like, okay, but I'm not going to totally write off everything uh, because there are, there are things you can learn how not to do. There's things you can learn, you know, that maybe they did get something right. You walk away and that's good. Um, uh, there was one class I attended with a big name instructor. Um, who, who's extremely popular. Uh, and the only thing I walked away with <coughs> from that class was, uh, uh, a better way to take targets. <laughs> uh, but it fucking saved me time in my classes. So I don't, was it worth 800 bucks? I don't know, but <laughs> you know, negative, negative taping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Now, um, let me add to that. Um, yeah, like like you said, go see other instructors. I, I've seen a couple at that you learn good and bad once you once you have an idea of what you're looking at. And there was one instructor I learned a couple of good things and learned a lot of things of well that's shit I'll never do especially in front of a class. Mm -hmm. But it was a learning environment by being there. Mm -hmm. One of my uh, one of my favorite moves to pull as an instructor is uh, when all the students get there I'll, I'll grab a target and I'll start writing down you know what how they define the context of the class like if it's you know defensive well tell me what defensive means in your own words and then we'll run down like okay what's your expectations for the class you know what would at the end of it what was worth the the time and the effort and they'll usually tell you like hey as long as we hit these notes i'm going to be happy it's not me saying i'm going to you know change my curriculum to meet you it's me saying, all right, now I know what you're looking at. And if things on um, throughput on a drill isn't what it needs to be, we have to drop something because somebody was having a problem with it. Like I can use that as my left and right limits. Instructors, you know, come at me and they're like, dude, that is awesome. I'm going to steal that drill or that technique. And I'm like, nah, all over at Redback One. I openly admit, I straight stole that from him as an instructor easier so sometimes you know the things just like mike was saying the and really a cool drill or you know a fancy way to articulate something it's just something that makes your life easier as an instructor mm -hmm. okay uh, so guys, Tim is keeping us in business here. So another good question. Um, how do you know how to decide who's the best trainer if you don't know what you can't define or what you think you need? Oh, geez, that's a fucking yeah. old question there. Yeah, <laughs> right. So uh, I'm going to try and pro I'm probably going to brutalize this, but cause I think we talked about it before. Um, whoever you are, whatever it is, I think you have to define your mission in order to define the skill sets in order to complete that mission as a uh, uh, armed responsible citizen. I think that mission is to get yourself and your family home uh, every day. Um, and what and then you have to define what skills you think you need in order to do that. Um, it's not, you know, carrying a drop leg holster, I, I don't think. Uh, it is taking courses in concealed carry, learning how to A, be accurate, uh, how to clear your cover garment, and all of the manipulations that it takes that you would encounter as a civilian. There may, there may be many to enumerate, but I think uh, it's more precise than I just want to be a gunfighter type of thing. Um, what are your guys' thoughts on that? Uh, we'll go with, we'll go with Adam first. He's muted. Hey brother, uh, come back to me after this. I was, you know, saying night to the wife and the kid. Oh, Roger that. All right. Hey, Varg, what do you think, bud? Um, I think that when they don't know what they're looking for, it's hard to find what you're, what you need. Um, and that is the problem. That's kind of what I've been talking about all night about how the standard is, is not high enough out there and people aren't being informed on the front end, on the very outward facing front end of this fucking industry, what it is that they need. Um, and so the only thing that, that you can do is sure, certainly you can sit there and say, well, you have to understand mission. Mission drives gear. Mission drives uh, uh, likely uh, needs for skills and techniques and procedures. Uh, this all makes sense to us. This is fucking like elementary things to us, but to them, they don't even, you know, mission is one of the first things I talk about in my level one classes, very first things in the morning lecture. And, and I ask people, what's your mission, you know, and, and most people can't even define what their mission is properly until we, we talk about it and get that sussed out. Because before I take you on the fucking range, 
you have to know why you're here. You know, and if you don't really know why you're here, you think you know, then it's even more of a problem because you think you know something that you have no fucking idea. Uh, so we have to suss that out and get that sorted out before you even get on the range to, to start doing the things because you can't understand the real principles behind the whys of when we do something if you don't understand the, the mission because the principles are based on the mission. Um, so the mission dictates everything. So it's, it's a starting point. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, you can't know the rest of it without knowing that first. So you're correct about that, Scott. But the problem is, is how do we convey that to people? Um, it's just like me at the, you know what I did at the, at the I talked about the cigar lounge this morning. Um, and they were talking about, uh, you know, it was literally Kimbers and, and Marines as, as the golden standard for gunfighting uh, instruction. It, all in one sentence and you know what I did I fucking smoked my cigar and I walked out here and I didn't say a word to anybody uh, and that's how I responded to it and and that's just more and more the way that I that I deal with it I personally have got to a point where I just only if you seek seek me out I will fucking give you my undivided attention if you're just you know an average person just running off at the mouth I'm not even going to engage in it because I don't even know um, if I have the temperament anymore to fucking to take that job on. Uh, you know, people and my point to that is people are not going to learn until they're ready to learn, until they're ready to shut their mouth and start thinking about what they need to do. Because uh, until then, they're getting these preconceived notions and these these ideas from Instagram and fucking uh you know, American Rifleman Magazine and what whatnot, and they're getting these ideas about what they need and, and what shit is going to work for them that's completely off base for their mission. It's completely off base for the realities of gunfighting, and it's way off base for the realities of, of violence. Uh, and so how do we convey that as instructors? I think we really need to talk about that, you know? How do we get that out there on the front end so they so they know where to look in the first place? What do you guys think? Yeah, I agree. I agree, man. The, I got to tell you, you know, every day goes by, and I, I, I don't want to say this, but it's like I, I care less and less about engaging. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, and it's tough for me. I was, you know, one of the things that my dad said that has always stuck with me was, "For every fool you suffer, he makes three more." Right. So. I'm always trying to correct stuff, but man, there's a lot of fools out there and I ain't got enough time and my, you know, to correct them all. So <coughs> you got to pick your battles. Otherwise you're going to drive yourself crazy. Anyway, uh, Mike, what are your thoughts? Um, I agree hundred percent mission drives, but beyond that, it takes an honest self-assessment of skill. You know, let's say I want to be Chuck Norris. <laughs> You know, Chuck Norris, Delta Force, whatever. You know, <laughs> but if I can't make it through a simple dot torture drill, what's the point in going? You know, it takes an honest assessment. You got to start at some point before you can get where you want to go. And you need to start there. Because if you try to go straight to where you're wanting to go without starting at the base, you're going to have a bad experience. The instructor is going to have a bad experience. The other students are going to have a bad experience. And you're going to leave frustrated and you're not going to get what you needed and you may or may not go back for more because of the frustration. Mm -hmm. So about Adam? Adam, you actually said something that I, one of the things you said made me laugh because um, one of the guys that I, I'm completely non shooting related, uh, I'm paying more attention to it and seeing what he's pushing is uh, Jack Donovan from uh, The Way of Men and Becoming Barbarian. And uh, he, in his second book, he goes on a tangent about why do we need to engage someone? We don't owe them anything. There's nothing I have to educate or bring you to my side of the argument. 
I don't owe you anything. If you're not part of my team, you're not part of my tribe. Um, and you choose not to educate yourself in the face of knowing that is your responsibility to be prepared to face, you know, whatever may be out there or to take responsibility for your own actions, to owe you anything. And I think that's a fine line that um, I've had to walk of, Hey, you want to be a good guy. You want to help somebody out. You see that, that guy in the, the gun store and he's going to fed a line of, you know, shit from the dude who's just trying to make a, a check from gun sales. Step in, like, offer your check. You got the guy behind the counter looking at you like you're the ass. Gun, like, well, who are you and why are you even involved in this conversation? Uh, so sometimes it's not even worth getting involved. Like, you know, we said earlier, if they seek you out and they're looking for knowledge, that's, but it's still their responsibility. And if they want it bad enough, they're going to find someone, you know, to teach them. So I don't necessarily owe you any, and it's not my responsibility until that time you come to me and say, I do want to learn. And then to teach you everything I can, real brain dump of here's everything. Now go forth, do great work. Are you engaged? You know, if you don't want to learn. That's, can I say something on the back end of that? Yeah, man. Um, so, so what he's, you know, that's the difference between asking and telling, right? Um, if they're telling, uh, then, then yeah, I'm not like where I was at this morning. They were telling, they were blah, 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 blah. I know this, I know that I'm not engaging in that. Like, uh, if I'm in, if I'm in a gun store, which sometimes I, I do, you know, fill in a gun store and I, you know, I, I work closely with one that's that's local to me. Um, if somebody comes up and says, Taurus is a great gun. Oh, okay, yeah, that's, that's pretty good, you know, whatever. Uh, uh, or they come up and say, is Taurus a good gun? Now, now we're going to get a different conversation, right? Um, and it really comes down to uh, when, when Adam's talking about responsibility, um, what what we have – and for me anyway, is I have so many people now that pull on me for information that actually pay me, that are, that are, that are paying students that come here, that, that, that patron my school. Um, they deserve my attention and my, my brain resources and my energies. Uh, and, and so I just reserve that for the people that are seeking it out. Not necessarily only the ones that are paying me, but, but primarily people who are asking, uh, if you're telling I'm going to, I don't give a fuck if you like, I don't, you can talk to me and tell me that, you know, your Taurus judge was the best damn thing that ever that, that, you know, you think soldiers should carry Taurus judges and war theaters. Like, I don't give a shit what you say to me. Uh, I'm going to walk away and maybe someday you'll be like, wow, like I said some dumb shit to that one guy and he actually knew a lot more shit. And you know what I mean? Like, I don't care what your awakening process is, but it's not going to be at my expense. Um, but if you're asking, then, then I think it's our responsibility to, to share good information, and especially give priority as instructors, give priority to the people that are actually paying us, the ones that actually come to our classes and have spent money with us and things like that. You know, they get priority with me. And then the people that are genuinely asking after that, you know, obviously get priority too. But if you're telling, I'm just going to let you tell your story, bro. I, it's, it's, it's not on me how that comes out. That's on you, you know. You guys sometimes feel that like people want to be spoon fed stuff. You know what I mean? I mean, not like asking questions here <laughs> in our audience or whatever like that, but it's like, so where do I begin? Okay. I got that. What's my next step? Just, just tell me what to do. And sometimes it's just, man, you got to find your own path. You know, my path is not going to be your path. There's no, there's no list here. You've checked off the boxes and now you're a squared away gunfighter. Um, what do you guys think about that? How do people find their path? I mean, that's, that's kind of, I, I'm kind of contradicting myself, right? But you know, if you guys want to talk about your path a little bit, how you found it, other people may take different ones. What's your guys' advice on that? Uh, Mike, we'll let you go first. Uh, my path was a little bit different. It started 
you know, when I was a kid, I wanted to learn to shoot. Then I wanted to join the army. I joined the army, wanted to be a good gunfighter, built a mediocre skill base. Um, and then, like I said earlier, met a couple really good guys, caught the training bug and decided here's the point in my life where my mission has now changed. You know, aside from professionally, my mission has now changed because I've now got a family. My mission outside of my professional commitments were at that point, get home to my family at the end of the day. And if my family was with me, be able to successfully defend my family. So it took figuring out what skill sets I needed to either get home to or defend my family. And that, that took a lot of soul searching because let's face it, I'm a man, I carried a gun for a living. I must be a gunfighter. Well, I had next to no training with a pistol to that point. So, you know, how are you gonna fight with a pistol if you don't know how to effectively use a pistol? So at that point, whoa, 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 let's ratchet back. Let's learn how to effectively use the pistol. Now that you can effectively employ that tool, let's learn the, the best tactics, techniques, and procedures to use with that tool under these conditions. So it's it's a uh, what it comes down to is self discovery, soul searching, and figuring out what you need, and then you seek out those that can advise you on how to get there. Right. And so at the risk of spoon feeding our audience, who were those trainers for you when your mission changed? Uh, who were those trainers that helped you accomplish that? Uh, they started with Troy Price, obviously. Um, and highlights after that, Troy with LMS Defense, Larry Vickers, um, Pat McNamara, Tom Gibbons. I didn't take Tom's normal class i took tom's instructor development class but either way there was a lot of material there that was good as well so i would say my big four were troy um tom larry and pat mark how about you um when i decided to go uh to the gun especially to the instructor side um I had the very, you know, lucky fortune of being um, having a guy named Tom Taylor take me under his wing, uh, and uh, Tom runs Ohio Valley Tactical, and he's uh, 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 on the county SWAT team down there. He's been uh, doing that door kicker thing for over twenty years, and he's uh, he's a really good guy, one of the best shooters I've ever been on the range with ever to this day. Um, he, he runs, he's got a shootout and runs a, a, a little SWAT school down there. Uh, he was on the same team with Hackathorn back in the day and him and Hackathorn and Vickers are all friends. Um, and he really, he really took me under his wing, like more than he ever had to. I, I went to a class. I told him my backstory as I always did with instructors. I said, Hey, you know, uh, I was on the other side of this thing and I've never had a problem with that. Um, and he took me in, and over the years, he really helped develop me as an instructor. He brought me in, and he'd say, hey, come down, watch me do this thing, or here's how you handle these fucking shithead students. And he's real old school and real like a R. Lee Ermey kind of guy. So, <laughs> it, you know, he's real a lot to take. Um, but he, he really did a lot for me uh, to bring me to this side that was like, okay, there's more to this. Than, than you know what I've previously seen on TV or or on YouTube, and then from there John Chapman was really instrumental uh, in in developing my purpose um, as an instructor and as a civilian uh, and in my career too, um, and then with LMS and then EAG and John Spears and and uh, Wire and all the guys that run around over there at, at uh, Alliance facility. Um, that's basically, you know, the group that I ended up falling into with instructor wise. But the first two guys really were, were Tom Taylor and John Chapman Chappie um, that really shaped, helped to shape my purpose, both, at, both as a civilian gun carrier and as an instructor of other people too. Uh, they're extremely influential uh, 
and what what came out of me from that point forward. Awesome, Adam. So, uh, um, <laughs> I was thinking on how to answer this best. Uh, I actually lost my way, um, and only had you know a buddy contact me. We we're having a conversation, and he was like, "Hey, dude, what's up?" To be all about knuckle trigger, knuckle dragon trigger pulling badass, and you know we're training war fighters, and he's like. All I ever hear you talking about anymore is, uh, you know, your family, your kid, uh, God bless America, and let's go hunt shit. <laughs> and it kind of made me pause. I was like, what are you talking about, man? And he's like, well, you know, you're not pushing out um, all this content of your training soldiers and uh, your, you know, Star Force Class Wilson, U.S. Army Sniper, blah, blah. I was like, that's not who I am anymore, you know? Um, if that's your expectation, you that anymore because I'm not, I'm not, um, you know, I'm in the middle of a medical retirement, leaving the uh, army completely. And, uh, you know, as much as I would like to say, yeah, I could still go kick in doors and I could go deploy and I could do all kinds of shit for eight days. I miss my kid. You know, I, I got a 10 month old son who, um, I have no interest in leaving for a year. You know, uh, I don't want to. I don't want to leave and go on a twelve-month deployment. And uh, you know, my only interaction with my family and my wife is you know via Skype. It sucks. Um, so now you know my way is becoming working with guys like Madi, one of our uh, you know group members. Madi is former student of mine fixing to go off to sniper school you know i can take my experience and help prepare Madi for that guy and maybe he'll he'll go on he'll do great things in, in the army and he'll be the next one in the shoot to train somebody after he, he's done with his time um i'm also doing more work with guys who have no interest in kicking indoors they just want to go into the back country they want to see you know that part of america that you're you're less of each day because of urban encroachment um, and they want to get back to being or embracing the lifestyle that we don't see anymore let me be independent let me go shoot let me you know hunt let me have fun versus oh let me throw on multi-cam and a plate carrier and go pretend I'm going to kick in a door so much time basically you know mutual masturbation talking about what's going to happen when somebody kicks in my door and this is what i'm going to do and i'm prepared i've got a point two split time how are you out you're spending with your family outdoors developing memories and you know bonds with them i lost my way and i've had to find a new way of who i am today and that's you know that that in of itself can be rough Especially when one of your buddies is like, but at the end of the day, you know, you got to live your life how you want. And I know I'm a hell of a lot happier doing what I am now than, you know, what I was when I was, you know, Sergeant First Class uh, Wilson, U.S. Army Sniper. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, how did I develop? my path. I mean, obviously it's still going, um, you know, a lot of stuff, a lot of training I do always gets back to the lessons I learned in jujitsu about if it, you know, if it works, it, it, it works. Uh, but it's got to follow a certain set of rules, how the body works. Uh, and can you vet it out in a repeatable process to do it, to be able to do it over and over again? Um, but I think I define what's important to me. You know, I don't want, I don't open carry. I come with concealment. So it was a natural progression to go seek training from Matt Jaques, who at the time around here was really the only one giving a nothing but fighting from concealment class. Uh, from there, it was a development of skill um, and performance, which Fisher has helped me out a lot with. Uh, in other aspects of 
pre and post engagement. Uh, John Murphy, a lot of people don't know about John Murphy. Um, I think he likes it that way. I'm not too sure, but his, his pre and post engagement classes that he gives, uh, are, are great. They really, really are great. So just like with, you know, fighting, uh, you got to know how to train all the ranges, whether it be long, intermediate, short, or on the ground, you've got to know all of the ranges within what you're trying to train uh, and what your mission is uh, to, to fulfill that training, to fulfill that mission. Uh, you know, I told, I told Adam, he yelled at me one time and said, uh, you were in Virginia before you moved out here, right? And I wasn't watching stuff. And I said, hey, you were in Virginia? And I, I didn't know this. He's like, dude, I only posted it like 10,000 places. I'm like, yeah precision that voodoo is beyond me right now right and probably was if i was into it i'd pay attention to what adam the, the, what he was doing at that point in time but i can't even fathom that stuff right now when i do i'll be looking him up but my path had not gotten to what his expertise was because uh, you know and you got to think about that stuff right what is important to you where is your progression going and how are you going to fulfill uh that requirement so, all right. What else, guys? Uh, so it looks like our, our YouTube chat is starting to slow down a little bit. Adams, I think Adams got a question there. Oh, did yeah. Okay. I got it's a good segue from what you were just saying there. Um, so, a uh, buddy text messaged me, and he's saying, you know, essentially, um, when you look, if I understand this correctly. Uh, it, when you're looking at training, you know, how do you decide what your focus is? Um, if it's just you by yourself, what's, you know, what training do you look at and where do you make your investments versus if it's you married with two, uh, two kids and a dog? Um, and I think that's actually, you know, relevant because one of the conversations my wife and I have on a regular basis is, uh, you know, all right, are you carrying, you know, what are you going to do? My, my wife and I both typically uh, carry concealed when we go out, but, um, if she chooses not to, or, you know, if I'm not for whatever reason, uh, we discuss that and have a plan and, we also are looking at is hitting up Steve Fisher when he comes out to uh, Alliance for um, two-person uh, defensive room clearing course. I forget what what his title that he did. And Steve, feel free to like kick me, you know, next time you see me for forgetting. But uh, basically, it, it, for us, it's a good opportunity to get out and train as a team to likely encounter. Hey, if somebody kicked in my door, I don't necessarily have to do that by myself. I'm married. I got a partner. And she's a legitimate sh uh, shooter. So why not, you know, stack the odds in your favor? Um, and I think it's important to look at what you will realistically encounter if you're training accordingly. When I was single and I was, you know, living out of my truck, traveling around, hitting up classes, I was taking the classes with uh, Vickers on one-man room clearing. Um, I was trying to take classes that benefited me um, as I've matured and I've gotten older. Okay, now I want to take backcountry wilderness medicine because I'm living in the backcountry and I've got a family and it might be a while before uh, medical aid gets here. So it would behoove me to know what to do. Does that mean that I can't apply TC3 protocols and you know what we learned in combat of how to stop the bleeding? May not encounter that what happens if my kid falls down and breaks an arm when he gets older so you know as we go through life or you change your your conditions it's important to look at do i need to change what i'm focusing my time my energy on learning yep great point great point <clears throat> All right, guys, so we've been on for a couple of hours now. I think we covered a lot of material. Um, don't seem to have any questions out there in chat. So I want to turn it over to you guys. Whatever you guys want to talk about, 
on the subject, if you want to plug anything, what's going on with your guys' schedule, where you're going to be at. Uh, let, let's go from there. So, uh, Varg, you want to start? Uh, yeah. So, I'm, uh, I, I run my, my uh, courses on my private range up here. Um, I've got a full schedule going on, uh, onelifedefense.com. If anybody wants to come and check me out, I'm not uh, – it, it, when I run on my, my range like that, it's a really, really reasonable fee to come out. Um, I'm trying to get linked up to do some uh, – I'm talking to a few guys about doing some work with uh, a couple other organizations in Ohio to get, to get a little more coverage there. Uh, so I might be traveling around there. Um, but outside of that, uh, that's pretty much what I'm doing every, just about every week I'm out on the range uh, <clears throat> doing something and um, trying to get more uh, combatives, bringing more combatives into it. Um, and basically, you know, just to tail off of what, what Adam was talking about there, I, I wanted to add some of that before we split. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so... <clears throat> the original question had something to do with, you know, how do I choose classes based on, you know, just protecting me versus protecting the family. Um, you know, and, and that, that is something like pretty easy to, uh, uh, look at what your circumstances are and then dictate that dictates what you have to do with the person that's next to you. So if the person is like in his, his case, uh, a, a wife that can shoot, um, if she's trained, they've talked about her procedures, they've talked about things uh, that involve two people, then that's that's one thing. And if not, then it's just somebody you need to protect, get them out of the way and all that kind of stuff. It's pretty simple. But I think across the board, that stuff is pretty, um, you know, it, it, it's pretty applicable no matter who's with you and who isn't, as long as you know where to put the person that's with you, where to put them. Um, and it's just like if you, it's no different if you're out in the public. Uh, you have to be aware of all that shit out there. Like if something goes down and people start panicking and running, you, you're responsible for not fucking shooting everybody in a room and they're running across your field of fire and stuff like that. So I don't think it's something to look at in terms of, am I training just to protect myself ever? I think you have to be responsible for your environment. I thought that was an important, important point. Um, if it's somebody that's with you or not with you, you still have to watch what's going on with people around you. So if you take team class stuff and you're only by yourself, one of the most beneficial things you get from, from teamwork is learning how to move around other bodies that don't need shot. Does that make any sense? So I think it's beneficial to still do team type stuff if you're at that level skill wise, uh, because you learn how to move around no shoot active uh, bodies um, and you will encounter no shoot active bodies in any situation that you're whether in, in your home with your family or out in the public so I think that I just wanted to throw that out there for whatever reason it just yeah. stuck out to me nope awesome uh, we're gonna go let Adam go before I think the kerosene runs out of his generator or some shit like that so Adam why don't you go ahead and go buddy oh. yep all right sorry about that um, uh, if anybody's looking to train or find out what I'm up to these days, uh, they can always visit the APO riflecraft.com website. A variety of the different course course developed where it's everything from, you know, intro to rifle hunting or rifle all the way out to, you know, extreme and ultra long range shooting where we can go beyond 2000 yards. Um, <coughs> Additionally, one of the, the programs we're launched is uh, APO Outfitters, um, with uh, a gentleman by the name of Steve Rand, um, professional hunter who uh, out of Afghanistan who's traveled the world hunting pretty much anything on four legs. Um, take guys, we can spin you up on how to run your gun or your, your long rifle, you know, recreationally, um, competitively, or if you want to hit the uh, brush, you know, harvest an animal under a variety of conditions, if it's above the wood line, um, hunting, or if it's, you know, trophy uh, bucks down in Texas. Uh, so they can also shoot me an email at, at 
aporiflecraft.com. And uh, the last thing that I would say is um, I actually had an inter interesting conversation with a, a buddy of mine by the name of Jim Gilliland at a recent competition. Uh, it was a precision rifle match. And Jim and I were talking about how uh, both of us shot the match. You know, here's a, a low-key club-level precision rifle match. Um, he's one of the legendary snipers in the community. Uh, badass behind a, a long gun. Um, I'd like to think I know a thing or two about running a bolt gun. And neither of us performed how we, you know, would have liked. And he laughed about it. And he was like, bro, you know as well as I do, you know, you can compete to win or you can compete to train and guys get wrapped around their head with the whole, you know, Oh, competition will get you killed. And, you know, we know Tor's article on, on that illustrates why it's nonsense, but com competition is also a great opportunity for the guys who are, you know, still going to carry a gun for whatever reason to develop those skill set. you know, from uh, a and rifle and snipe, you know, if our young guys were out there shooting that match, um, hell, Motti drove up so he could watch the match. He applied some of the techniques he saw on a range. Great example of how we can develop our young snipers or young shooters through competition. Come out with the mindset of, oh, I need to place first, uh, first and I need to walk away with something off the prize table. Dude, just get your ass out there, pull the trigger, and learn how to run that gun brain and take that experience and then apply it in whatever context you want. That's the final thing I got for it. You can compete to win or you can compete to train. Nice. All right, cool. Uh, Mike, what's going on with you, man? Um, again, I'm in the middle of retooling. Hopefully I'll be back up and running in the next 45 to 60 days. So stay tuned there. Um, once I'm back up and running, you can look for me in the Carolinas, potentially Virginia. Um, and to add on to what Adam was saying with competition, I take a, a slightly different viewpoint on competition. I don't look at competition as training. What I do look at it as is a great chance to compare notes with other people. So you can glean lessons from other people. It's a great chance to shake out your skills and to test them under a, a, a bit of pressure. You know, whether the pressure is a shot timer, whether the pressure is, oh my God, that's a tiny target at a long distance, whether the pressure is shooting in front of an audience, there is a bit of pressure there. So it's a great chance to shake out your skills and you find your weak points. Push yourself to the point of failure. Don't be afraid of losing the match. You should be there to better yourself. So push your point to the, push yourself to the point of failure in a match, and then take those failure points and train with them later. So if your thing's precision rifle, if your thing's three gun, where you want to run multiple weapons, if you want to be you know pistol shooter, there's IPSC, IDPA. Just get out there and shoot. Yep. Uh, so I won't go too much into competition and why I think it's awesome. I think you guys all know that, uh, that I compete a lot, but, uh, you know, one thing I will add about competition, um, is that it gets you out of that square range mentality. Uh, you can do a lot of stuff. You can get very lazy when all you're doing is shooting straight in front of you. Uh, when you have to move and shoot in different directions from awkward positions and you see other people do it effortlessly, uh, you're not going to get that just by shooting straight in front of you all the time and, and on a square range. So just getting on the competition side of things, right? Um, so uh, what am I doing? I'm, I'm taking a whole bunch of courses this week, uh, or I'm not this week. This, this year, it seems like May and June are coming out. Uh, Aaron Cowan's actually teaching uh, his basic uh, self-defense pistol out here in June. Um, a little-known guy who's getting well-known uh, in the self-defense and competition world is a guy by the name of Gabe White. Uh, he's going to be out here at the beginning of June. Vogel's coming out. I'm going to try and make his class. I think Fish is going to be out here, too. Uh, 
kind of convince Bev to let me go up to Ohio. I'm going to look at uh, Varg's schedule, get up there as well, and all that. I'm shooting matches, and I'm teaching basic pistol skills stuff. Uh, I do private lessons as well. Um, so that's, that's what I'm doing, guys. Uh, I think the overall thing is just get out and train. I don't think there's a single one of us on here that hasn't made a training mistake, but we took that, you know, we took whatever mistake it was and, um, turned it into something good of maybe what not to do or, or warn somebody else going on. So, uh, before I wrap it up, uh, Adam, you got one more thing, buddy. Yeah. So, uh, we're sitting here talking about training and, uh, inviting guys out to come train with some whatnot, um, for the panel, for each of us as, you know, professional instructors, guy that you're investing your time with in the next year, or better yet name three dudes that you're saying, these are who I want to go train with. Um, and why you would encourage guys for it. Uh, I know for Steve Fisher, I want to hit that, uh, you know, couples room class. He's a uh, vehicle CQB class. And uh, I want to hit up Brian Litz's ballistic seminar. No shooting involved, just straight up science of long range. But I want to sit there and learn from the guy who was a former ballistician short list and if a guy is looking at like okay who is he going to train worth in it that's who i'm saying i want to I'll learn from all right so that's all uh, who do you want to work with three guys yeah go ahead mark um uh, i'm gonna say fisher uh i'd like to take petty's course and I'm I'm already signed up to go train with uh, Rory Miller. I don't know if you guys know who that is, but uh, he's a little bit outside of the gunfighting lane. Uh, but he's the, he wrote the book Meditations on Violence and Scaling Force. Um, and uh, I've become I've I've got somewhat of a of a rep rapport with him over the years. And I'm actually going down to Violence Dynamics in June with. Uh, him and a couple other guys um, and, and going to do some infighting stuff and some, and some violence work. And they really have like a, so, so my point on that is broaden your spectrum outside of, like he said, he's taking one that's, you know, not a straight up gunfighting course. So that's, that's exactly what I'm doing too. Um, so I'm, I'm excited about that. Um, and uh, the other ones are basically just, you know, Fisher, uh, probably the uh, pistol shootouts, which is the two-man room clearing thing, and then um, uh, Petty's uh, vehicle course, um, and then Rory Miller. I think that maybe if you're going to name three, try to pick one that's outside of like the normal, the normal sphere of things that we would normally look at. Yeah, cool, Mike. What you got, buddy? Who you training with, man? Um, again, Larson is going to be my next one. Same thing, not necessarily a shooting course, but to get into the in-depth uh, system of the AR. Uh, second one I would love to go see would be Fisher. Um, and for a third, I'm probably going to go see Dan Flowers, uh, the Ballistic Edge. That man has <coughs> melted my brain talking ballistics and talking barrel harmonics. And I think there's a lot to learn from Dan, uh, software instead of hardware. Cool. Uh, I think I listed a whole bunch of guys that I am training with. Um, one guy I forgot to mention because it's going to be um, kind of an impromptu thing. Uh, I, I don't know if you guys, you know, he's a, he's a PNS moderator, uh, Tim Heron, grandmaster. Uh, and I'm going to go, up his up to his place uh kansas city missouri i'm gonna sleep on his couch and we're gonna train for two days uh because anybody who is that small that can run a 1911 the way he does that's just voodoo man it's crazy so uh that's the guy who's kind of outside of the norm for us that uh, i can't wait to go train with him and that'll probably happen 
probably towards the end of summer because of competition season and stuff like that. But other guys, you know, uh, the way I'm starting to do it, other than, you know, people that uh, I'm, you know, uh, close to like Varg, who doesn't have a competitive background, um, everybody else has both a tactical and uh, competition background. So, you know, guys like Vogel, you know, Fisher obviously used to compete. Um, uh, who else? Pannone. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm finding that those are often, at least for me right now, uh, that next level of understanding of the, uh, the shooting is shooting. It's how you apply it, you know? So, um, all right. Well, if you guys, if you have nothing else to add, you know, let's do, let's, let's pay the bills a little bit for guys if, uh, out there in the audience. If you, if you dug content like this and more, uh, you can check us out on primary and secondary.com and, uh, lots of sub forums on there, lots of articles. Uh, lately the articles have been up like every other day. So come and check those out. Um, check out our 785 Facebook groups. Uh, going from everything to the main page down to new <laughs> basket weaving. No, I'm just, I'm kidding. Just go ahead and check out the pages. Um, if you've got an interest, go to the main page. If you don't know if, if it covers one of your interests, just uh, check out the admins or the mods and, and we'll direct you to the right places. Uh, if you are so inclined and want to maybe pay for a little of the content, go to uh, patreon.com slash primary and secondary give your donation where it is you get to join network support they often get um some uh they get stuff first they get some discount codes and cool stuff like that um but you know write us a write us a review on itunes and the podcasts um and uh you know give us those five star reviews give us some feedback uh despite what other people say you know we moderators are not dicks uh we just you know we are going to uh, express our opinions with facts and veracity, 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 whatever. Uh, you guys know what I mean. Um, from my end guys, you know, I just want to thank some of the guys that support me F3 tactical overwatch precision triggers, um, tough products, red Hill tactical. You guys got anybody you want to plug before we go? Anybody? Mark, come on, buddy. You got to plug, you got to plug your new people. Oh, oh. Get, get the market. There you go, buddy. You guys, yeah. seriously, everybody's changing. The, 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 the game is changing right now. And if you are a, a gun business, you really, really need to take a different look at, at what marketing is going to be in the near future here because the YouTube changed the way that things, that, you know, they're choking the shit out of it. Uh, so it's going to take a real creative marketing team and get – uh, not to not to toot my own horn since I'm on that team, but I'm telling you, I don't think there's a more like capable team in this industry right now. So definitely check us out if you need anything done, SEO, social media, uh, uh, website, Gap Marketing. Yep. Oh, and before I forget, when I go out to Tim Herons, uh, I may or may not be shooting my competition gun, but Matt Lanfair is giving me a Nighthawk the premier 1911 company out there to go out there and train. Right, Matt? You're not on there, so you can't reply, so you got to do it. Moving on. Mike, what you got, buddy? Uh, who you want uh, to I'm not sponsored. <laughs> so I will plug the one man that has done more in the last year to push me, to push myself than anyone else, and that would be Ash Hess. Um, for those who don't know, he has, he has changed the lexicon of army marksmanship and weapons employment over the last couple of years. Um, he's fixing to retire from the army. He's teaching under warrior industries and he's teaching out of, I want to say LaGrange, Georgia. Mm. So if you're in the Georgia area, check, check Ash out. He's got some good stuff. He's a good dude. Good dude, man. So, um, Adam, you got everybody you want to plug, man. You got anybody else? Uh, yeah, I'll hit one more. Um, living out in the, the country, uh, I find myself with a lot of travel time these days. So I'm listening to a podcast uh, more and more and uh, enjoying with the new new lifestyle is uh, Stephen Ranella, Meat Eater TV. Um, he takes a really storytelling approach. Uh, he's got a Netflix show too, but um, 
he talks about, you know, classic Americana and uh, hunting and the values and ideals that, you know, so many of us grew up on when, you know, fathers are teach us how to shoot and, and hunt and uh, getting back to that. Um, he also talks about some of the things in the industry and, you know, ironically, he was, there was a podcast on shot show I was listening to the other week. So um, if you're looking for, if you're stuck in traffic and you want something non-tactical, I'm going to shoot somebody in the face, check out that Steven Ranella uh, meat eater TV. Awesome. Cool. All right, guys. Um, Wix are, I guess we're just hanging up now since our guys, so since the main controllers don't have internet. So uh, thanks a lot, guys. Awesome time. Audience, hope you enjoyed it and uh, be good. All right. See you later, guys.